Much of our past is forgotten. What we know of the Romans, Greeks and ancient Egyptians are merely the scant remains of records which were mostly destroyed. The Library of Alexandria, the greatest storehouse of ancient knowledge, was nothing but a heap of rubble and ash by 642 AD. The library's successor, the city of Baghdad, was able to recover and restore much classical knowledge and history. However, it too would fall, sacked and burned by stampeding Mongol forces in the 13th century. Decades later, when the Spanish conquered the Americas, the ancient knowledge of those lands was lost also, tossed into the fire by those who considered it heresy. These cycles of destruction have left us with little more than obscure remains, glimpses into incomplete histories and lost peoples. It is from these remnants that we are forced to reconstruct our past. Thus, we look to the stones and shards of pottery in the ground, hoping for a revelation, all the while ignoring the stories which have been handed down, generation after generation, which tell of a fantastical and forgotten past. In these tales, mysterious peoples flourished with an abundance of technology and culture only to be obliterated by the forces of nature. It is in these tales that lost civilizations live on, civilizations which may have once existed. When Europeans first discovered the New World, there was one thing that fascinated them above all else. Gold. There was gold everywhere. Natives adorned houses and clothes with the precious metal, frivolously using it as a beautiful substance to be moulded for ornamental use. For Europeans, gold, for all its beauty, had a far more practical purpose. Gold was the means to acquire land and title back in Europe. In the midst of the feverish pursuit for wealth, many Europeans encountered tales of a city filled with indescribable riches and gold. The stories described the city as imperial in size. It was said to lie in the jungles of South America, and was referred to as the Empire of El Dorado, the Empire of the Golden Man. In 1638, Juan Rodriguez Friel wrote to the governor of Guatavita, describing a peculiar story which was being told to conquistadors by natives of South America. The king would spend some time secluded in a cave, without women, forbidden to eat salt or to go out during daylight. The first journey he had to make was to go to the great lagoon of Guatavita, to make offerings and sacrifices to the demon which they worshipped as their god and lord. During the ceremony which took place at the lagoon, they made a raft of rushes, embellishing and decorating it with the most attractive things they had. At this time, they stripped the heir to his skin and anointed him with a sticky earth on which they placed gold dust so that he was completely covered with this metal. They placed him on the raft and at his feet they placed a great heap of gold and emeralds for him to offer to his god. When the raft reached the centre of the lagoon, they raised a banner as a signal for silence. The gilded Indian then threw out all the pile of gold into the middle of the lake, and the chiefs who had accompanied him did the same on their own accounts. After this, they lowered the flag, which had remained up during the whole time of the offering, and as the raft moved towards the shore, the shouting began again, with pipes, flutes and large teams of singers and dancers. With this ceremony, the new ruler was received and was recognised as Lord and King. What was being described was in fact an old Moisca tradition, the Moisca being the native people of Colombia. Such gold-encrusted initiation ceremonies did in fact happen in lakes across the Americas. This tale of golden abundance was one of many which whetted the appetites of conquistadors searching for the fabled kingdom. And indeed, many Spanish explorers like Hernán Cortés and Francisco Pizarro 
did uncover unimaginable quantities of gold. These instances served to fuel the search for El Dorado even more, with the New World being regarded as limitless in its potential for precious metals. The conquistadors Lazaro Fonte and Hernán Pérez even went so far as to drain Lake Guatavita in 1545, in the hopes of finding some of the riches which had been so haphazardly disposed of by the natives in their ceremonies. They found a modest amount of gold at great expense, resulting in many other gold-hungry explorers redraining the same lake for centuries afterwards in search of gold. Lake draining became such a problem that in the present day, such activities have been made illegal by the government of Colombia. None of this, however, proved the existence of El Dorado. For that, deeper exploration was required. In the 16th century, Francisco de Orellana and Gonzalo Pizarro set off along the Amazon River in search of the fabled kingdom and its gold. What they initially found, however, was far from the riches they desired. Repeated attacks by fierce native people propelled Pizarro to retreat. Orellana continued. Against all odds, he eventually made it to the Atlantic Ocean, becoming the first to traverse the entire Amazon River. When he returned to Spain, he spoke of an advanced civilization filled with riches amidst the Amazonian jungle. For much of history thereafter, people have generally assumed that Orellana had exaggerated his experiences in order to obtain more funding for another expedition to the Amazon. That his El Dorado could not have existed in a jungle filled with bad soil and savage people. However, recent evidence suggests that Orellana may not have been wrong. In 2011, the BBC documentary Unnatural Histories detailed how the deforestations that occurred in the Amazon jungle in the 1970s uncovered large man-made glyphs in the ground. Alongside this discovery was the uncovering of large amounts of terra preta, or black soil. Terra preta is a highly fertile man-made soil which infuses the normal, less fertile Amazonian soil with charcoal, bone and manure in order to make it more productive. This indicates that an advanced kingdom may have once populated the area of the Amazon. Some have even speculated that such a society may have propagated the largest rainforest in the world. Perhaps it was this thriving civilization which instilled the native peoples of the Americas with stories of El Dorado to tell the Spaniards. The theory of El Dorado goes on to suggest that since Spaniards tended to cohabit with their animals, including pigs, Orellana inadvertently spread virulent diseases as he travelled along the Amazon River. A civilization that may have supported a population of nearly 10 million may have suffered millions of deaths. Whilst an unimaginably vast scale of destruction, the death of millions due to disease is not unreasonable, considering that researchers from the University of Berkeley have estimated that Cortez's arrival in Mexico in 1518 diminished a population of 25 million to a mere 700,000 by 1623, a 97% drop. Thus, it may well be that El Dorado was once a very real city, but met its end at the hands of pestilence and disease. Indian mythology is filled with accounts of cities and lands being submerged by the sea. One such myth, which spoke of seven submerged temples in southern India, has evidence of actual existence, when in 2002, an underwater team discovered a maze of walls and temples off the southern coast of India. Two years later, right before the catastrophic Indian Ocean tsunami hit, the shoreline of southern India receded into the ocean enough to reveal a series of stone walls buried under the sand. When the great waters collided with the land, they dragged pieces of a once magnificent kingdom onto the shore, including an elaborate stone statue of a lion. These discoveries have led many to speculate how much truth remains concealed in southern India's mythology. After all, 
there are many more submerged cities reported in its literature. One story in particular grips imagination. The modern Tamil people of India speak of a great civilization that once existed on a large landmass off the southern tip of India. This ancient land is called Kumari Kandam. The land was supposedly ruled by Pandyan kings, a historical dynasty of the Tamil people for close to 11,000 years. The genesis of the legend can be traced back to the 2nd century AD. One of the five epic works of Tamil literature mentions a land belonging to the Pandyan kings being devoured by a cruel sea. In the 7th century, a Tamil commentary contained a comprehensive list of all the Pandyan kings which ruled Kamari Kandam. The list covered many thousands of years. It was said that in this land, the kings established Tamil Sangams, assemblies of scholars and poets, to help promote the perfection of Tamil culture and language. According to the commentary, the first Sangam was established around 9000 BC and lasted 4,440 years. It was around this time that part of Kamari Kandam was submerged by the sea. Over the course of the millennium that would proceed, the society moved north as their once great kingdom was slowly conquered by the waves. By the time Kamari Kandam was fully submerged, the Pandyan kings had moved into India and established the Tamil culture that exists there today. Perhaps surprisingly, there is much to indicate the possibility of there having once been such a landmass, with a cultured civilization living upon it south of India. Many languages spoken by native Africans, Australians and other islands in the vicinity bear a striking resemblance to the Tamil language. Further hints of its existence come from the Greek explorer Megasthenes. In the 4th century BC, he stated that Sri Lanka was only separated from mainland India by a river. This observation was made at a time which would correlate with the alleged gradual flooding of Kamari Kandam. It was in the 19th century when scholars truly turned their eyes in the direction of the legendary city. Many scholars theorized that a continent had indeed connected Madagascar, India and Africa, since these areas shared many similarities in biodiversity and geology. Scholars called this continent Lemuria, but Tamil nationalists instantly saw a connection between Lemuria and their legend of Kamari Kandam. As such, they popularized the theory of Lemuria as proof that their ancient homeland had most certainly once existed and had been the cradle of their culture and civilization. As for the scholars at that time, whilst many did agree that there may have been a continent, they stated that Lemuria was too old to have been inhabited by people. Since the 19th century, succeeding academics have undone much of the work to prove Lemuria's existence. The theory of plate tectonics, for example, may have ruled out the possibilities that there ever was a landmass connecting these areas. Instead, it is proposed that Madagascar, India and Africa were once connected and then simply drifted apart. Some scholars have questioned further, attacking the authenticity of the historical accounts which Tamil scholars use to evidence the existence of Kamari Kandam. Despite mainstream scholars' best efforts to disprove the legend of this incredible city, the mythical land is still regarded as real by many people. And with recent discoveries of underwater cities off southern India's coast, it seems that there may just be some truth in the folklore of ancient people. As such, the debate over the existence of Kamari Kandam will continue to rage on. For millennia, people have heard that somewhere around Tibet, there exists a utopian kingdom of peace and harmony known as Shamhala. Shambhala was said to be a kingdom where an advanced civilization of people lived in perfect peace. In this kingdom, technology reached such a supremacy that people neither suffered nor felt old age. They had uncovered the secrets of immortality. 
Shamhala was a veritable heaven on earth. For this reason, it was said that the kingdom could only be found by the select who have attained spiritual enlightenment in the ways of Buddhism. Many have taken the descriptions of Shamhala to be a metaphorical heaven for those who follow the ways of Buddhism. However, many believe that it was, and perhaps still is, a real place. Over the centuries, explorers and those seeking spiritual enlightenment have sought out Shambhala. Some have claimed success, alleging to have been there. Ancient Tibetan texts locate Shambhala in the Punjab province of northern India. Mongolian folklore places Shambhala in the southern valleys of Siberia. There are even legends of an ancient forgotten Buddhist temple in the Himalayas that houses the entrance to the Divine Kingdom. More modern Buddhist scholars believe that Shambhala exists in the highest reaches of the mountain range. Some theories go further, however, alleging that Shambhala does not exist on the surface of the earth, but rather below it, deep underground in the earth's core. Until recently, many Westerners referred to Shambhala by a different name, Agatha. Admiral Richard Byrd, a high-ranking officer in the United States Navy who received a Medal of Honor and was the first man to fly over the South Pole, is said to have claimed to have journeyed to Agatha after discovering an opening to the center of the Earth in the North Pole. According to Byrd, the Earth is hollow and shelters within it extensive waterways, green vegetation, and an advanced race of beings. Another report of the mythical world comes from the Polish explorer and university professor, Ferdinand Osendowski. During his travels across Asia, he often heard mention of an advanced kingdom under the earth. In his 1922 book, Beasts, Men and Gods, he recalled a story told to him. More than 60,000 years ago, a holy man disappeared with a whole tribe of people under the ground and never appeared again on the surface of the earth. Many people, however, have since visited the kingdom. Yet, no one knows where this place is. One says Afghanistan, others India. All the people there are protected against evil and crimes do not exist within its boundaries. Science has there developed calmly and nothing is threatened with destruction. This kingdom is a Ghati. It extends throughout all the subterranean passages of the whole world. I have heard that all the subterranean caves of America are inhabited by the ancient people who have disappeared underground. Traces of them are still found on the surface of the land. You know that in the two greatest oceans of the east and the west, there were formerly two continents. They disappeared under the water but their people went into the subterranean kingdom. In underground caves, there exists a peculiar light, which affords growth to the grains and vegetables and long life without disease to the people. In the 1920s, several expeditions were made to Asia searching for Shamhala. They were led by Nicholas Rowich, a Russian-born artist, archaeologist and philosopher who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for his attempts to preserve art and architecture during times of war in the early 20th century. During his expeditions, he documented many accounts that seemed to confirm Osendowski's testimonies that such a mighty heavenly domain existed. More than that, however, he himself experienced something bizarre. As he was camping in Shargal Valley near the Mongolian border, he and his son witnessed a golden spherical object in the sky. In other words, they witnessed what in the modern day is called a UFO. To Buddhist Lamas at the time, however, the object was not a mystery. The golden sphere was a sign of Shambhala, sent to tell the Russian archaeologist that his expedition was blessed by the laws of the enigmatic kingdom. Strangely, that area of the world is still a hotspot for reports of UFOs. In fact, flying saucers are a common sighting in and around the locations where Shamhala is supposedly thought to be. It is thought by some that such flying machines are the advanced technology of the people of Shamhala. 
Barring the testimonies of western explorers seeking Shamhala, the Divine Kingdom is actively spoken of. To Buddhist Lamas in particular, Shamhala is real, in both a physical and spiritual sense. Certainly, Lamas trained for many years for the explicit purpose of journeying to Shamhala. In 1985, the 14th Dalai Lama offered his thoughts on the mythical kingdom. He said that, Although those with special affiliation may actually be able to go there through their karmic connection, nevertheless, it is not a physical place that we can actually find. We can only say that it is a pure land, a pure land in the human realm, and unless one has the merit and the actual karmic association, one cannot actually arrive there. With descriptions such as this one, perhaps the pure and divine land of Shamhala is indeed real, and the reason we do not have many accounts of it is because no one wishes to return once they have found it. Yet, there is hope of clarification in the future. Many Buddhists believe that the secrets of Shamhala will be revealed in time. It is prophesied that when all the world is corrupted by materialism and united under an evil king, Shamhala will reveal itself and cleanse the earth of its barbarism. The year for this occurrence is hotly debated. Some say 2424, and others suspect a date as early as 2029. In the year 450 BC, the Greek historian Herodotus wrote about Hyperborea, a kingdom whose people were affluent and influential enough to transmit goods all the way from the northern reaches of Europe to the Greek island of Delos. Their lives were described by the classical Greek poet Pindar. Neither disease nor bitter age is mixed in their sacred blood, far from labour and battle they live. Later chroniclers would elaborate on Pindar and Herodotus' accounts of these exotic northern people. Greeks credited the Hyperborean as genius people untouched by the usual hardships faced by humanity, like war and old age. So advanced were they, that according to the Greeks, it was in fact them who built the great temple of Apollo at Delphi. It was from their land that the god Apollo originated, and in which a theocracy ruled, with three priest kings serving in Apollo's name at its head. Of the many writings of Hyperborea, most have been lost to time. Fortunately, the writings of Diodorus Siculus, a Greek historian of the 1st century BC, have survived. He preserved a fragment from another historian of the 4th century BC, Hecateus of Abdera, who described the whereabouts of the Hyperboreans. In the regions beyond the land of the Celts, there lies in the ocean an island no smaller than Sicily. This island, the account continues, is situated in the north, and is inhabited by the Hyperboreans, who are called by that name because their home is beyond the point where the north wind blows and the island is both fertile and productive of every crop, and has an unusually temperate climate. Hecateus further elaborated on the Hyperboreans as having a magnificent sacred precinct of Apollo, and a notable temple which is adorned with many votive offerings, and is spherical in shape. The descriptions of spherical temples have led many to believe that it was Stonehenge which Hecateus was describing thus placing Hyperborea in Britain. Yet, this theory does not match with some of the more notable descriptions of Hyperborea. Many describe it as having 24 hours of sunlight and only one sunrise and sunset a year. Such a description places this land in the Arctic Circle, leading many to conclude that it was in fact a classical Scandinavian kingdom. In many respects, this makes sense. Certainly, the legend of Hercules, involving him hunting the golden-antlered hind of Artemis in Hyperborea, reindeer being the only deer whose females bear antlers, easily locates Hyperborea in Scandinavia. However, similar descriptions can also be made of Russia's Siberian regions, where recent archaeological evidence has indicated that there existed a high level of civilization at one point. 
In the Ural Mountains of Siberia in particular, some sites contain evidence to indicate that every house in the area was engaged in copper and bronze metallurgy. This means that the ancient populations of Siberia were not only industrious, but lived comfortably for the time, with ovens, food storage and wells for fresh water. It must not, however, be forgotten that Hyperborea was often described as an island. The Greeks were not the only ones to write of a mysterious island populated by a cultured civilization. In the Irish Book of Invasions, it is stated that some of the Irish population sailed to mysterious northern islands, returning later to Ireland with new knowledge. Irish oral mythology seems to be in agreement with the Greeks, in that there existed a sophisticated island civilization somewhere in the Arctic Circle. Acknowledgement of such a society goes further as well. Ancient Babylonian accounts speak of great sages living far to the north. Even ancient Vedic texts from India attest to an advanced civilization of wise men living in northern lands. Whatever happened to Hyperborea, if real, is not known. Some say that its civilization moved south over time and helped craft Celtic cultures. Since the Celts are known to have migrated and settled over vast areas in Eurasia, it would help explain why the legend exists in so many cultures. Some have even gone so far as to link Hyperborea with Atlantis. According to ancient sources, however, Atlantis was a very different city. Histories tell of a mighty power, which was aggressing wantonly against the whole of Europe and Asia. This power came forth out of the Atlantic Ocean, for in those days the Atlantic was navigable, and there was an island situated in front of the Straits which you call the Columns of Heracles. The island was larger than Libya and Asia put together, and was the way to the other islands, and from the islands you might pass through to the whole of the opposite continent, which surrounded the true ocean, for this sea which is within the Straits of Heracles is only a harbour, having a narrow entrance, but that other is a real sea, and the surrounding land may be most truly called a continent. Now in the island of Atlantis there was a great and wonderful empire which had rule over the whole island and several others as well as over the parts of the continent. And besides these, they subjected the parts of Libya within the columns of Heracles as far as Egypt, and of Europe as far as Italy. This was the story told to the Athenian statesman Solon by Egyptian priests in the Temple of Sais in Egypt in 600 BC. That this story reaches us today is because it was recorded by Plato, thus the story of Atlantis has been handed down for centuries for the western world to ponder over. The priests of the Egyptian temple also told of the cataclysm which destroyed Atlantis, which occurred some 9,000 years earlier, in 9,600 BC. This is a curious date for it coincides with the end of an era of rapid cooling which occurred for over a thousand years, called the Younger Dryas period. Around 9600 BC, a rapid warming period was occurring, which many argue caused great floods around the world. The cause of the Younger Dryas period, it is theorized, was a comet. It is this sudden rise in sea level which is associated with the sinking of Atlantis. Recent academic theories place the possibility of this comet impact around 10,890 BC, due to the physical evidence present around this time. Physical evidence includes compressed nanodiamonds, which are said to have been remnants of a high-impact disaster. A testament to the global reach of this catastrophe is the fact that such physical evidence has been found across many continents. It has been suggested that the world's oldest megalithic site, Gebekli Tepe in Turkey, contains records of this cosmic impact. This structure is thousands of years older than the pyramids, and its function remains a mystery. 
However, the carvings on the vulture stone seem to record a great object impacting the earth in 10,950 BC. It may have even been the case that the whole site of Gebekli Tepe was built to record astronomical events, especially meteoroid showers. Curiously, the founding of this site seems to have been around the same time that Atlantis was said to have disappeared off the earth. All of this evidence points to a cataclysmic natural disaster having occurred around the time that Atlantis is said to have fallen. Could such a cataclysm have destroyed an entire civilization? At a temple in Egypt, there exists some hieroglyphics which tell of an island which served as the homeland of the gods. They lived there until a catastrophe befell the island. After this, their homeland ended in darkness, beneath the primeval waters. Even more mysterious, however, are the texts from the temple which hint at some sort of artificial source of illumination described as the Sound Eye. According to the texts, the whole island fell into darkness when the Great Flood hit. Is this evidence of advanced technology? It is further suggested in the temple's inscriptions that Atlantis was not entirely destroyed in a single day. Rather, the Great Flood inundated most of the island, resulting in an attempt by the gods to reclaim the land they had lost. Eventually, however, the project was abandoned. The island was far too destroyed to be reclaimed. After this, the gods were said to have crossed the world on a civilizing mission. What happens after the fall of Atlantis can allege to be correlated with several myths from around the world. From Central America, to Mesopotamia, to of course, the gods of Egypt. What these myths have in common is the arrival of peoples from a far off place to teach tribal people agriculture, animal herding, and other hallmarks of primitive civilization. And the timing is remarkable. According to Plato's writings, Atlantis was destroyed in 9600 BC. About a hundred years later, the foundations of agriculture are firmly in place in the Levant region of the Middle East. The location of Atlantis has always been an elusive mystery. Plato mentions that it is beyond the Straits of Gibraltar, between Europe and the other continent, presumably the Americas. The mention of the other continent in Plato's record has always been a source of contention, but if it does mean the Americas, then it would indicate that the ancient Egyptians were at least aware of something which would take thousands of years for Western civilization to rediscover. Some say that it was in fact Indonesia, with recent archaeological evidence at a site there revealing some carbon dates older than 12,000 BC. Yet, if the era of the 10th millennium BC is one defined by cataclysmic natural disasters, then it would not be unreasonable to think that there was more than just Atlantis that existed in this ancient world. The world may have been much as it is today, divided between developed and developing areas. One day, it all changed. A comet ravaged the earth, and in the great waves that encompassed the old world, a new one was baptized into being. It is a frightening prospect to consider, for it means that everything all nations have ever done today could tomorrow only exist in an obscure reference written by some future philosopher. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this, please be sure to watch my video on archaeological mysteries that have perplexed experts. You can also subscribe for more videos, or check out my new website, The History Scholar, for additional content. Links are in the description. I look forward to reading your thoughts in the comments.